Welcome to the Vault Podcast, classic music reviews, presented by IV Creative. Now, here's your hosts, B. Cox and the crew. Greetings and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Vault Podcast, classic music reviews, presented by IV Creative. It's a perspective of the classics from a fresh point of view. We appreciate you for taking your time and lending your ears to our perspective. You could be anywhere listening to anything, but you're right here with us, so we thank you. With you today is yours truly, Pete Cox, and want to give a shout out to all the fans out there, stateside and worldwide, for continuing to rock with us. Guys, we thank you so much for your support. As always, you can catch us at vaultclassicpod.com. Once again, that's vaultclassicpod.com. You can go to that website. Check us out, read the reviews, also check out the past episodes. You can also go to our merchandise store and check us out. We have t-shirts, hoodies, tumblers, mugs, iPhone cases, stickers, anything else you can think about as well. You can go there at vaultclassicpod.com to the store and check out all the merchandise that we have. You can also then go to our Buy Me A Coffee page to click on the coffee cup in yellow shaded in the bottom left hand corner to go there and leave a monetary donation to support the show to make sure that we can keep the vault open for many years to come. So go to vaultclassicpod.com. You can check out all of our social media pages as well. Click on those icons on the page. Give us a follow on every one of those platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube. We appreciate all the support and want to connect with you as we continue on our journey here on the Vault Classic Music Reviews Podcast. As we always say here on the Vault, our motto is hashtag open the vault, hashtag nothing but the classics or MBTC. And today it's a bonus episode as we continue to roll on towards summer 2023. And we got some great things coming up. Some bonus segments we know that you all will appreciate a lot, so make sure y'all stay tuned for that. But today in this bonus episode, I want to take a little bit of a different direction. Now, I was watching TV recently, and I've been on leave since my son was born about six weeks ago, and I'm getting ready to head back to work. Actually, as the listening of this episode, I will be back to work. And I was watching something on television and saw... A trailer for what I saw was going to be, they called it a podcast. It actually was going to be, they said, a eight part visual podcast, a podcast in documentary format chronicling Notorious B.I.G.'s, a.k.a. Biggie's life after death. And it's part of a series that WMX is putting together. The name of the series is Iconic Records, album that defined a generation. It's a series that will continue with different albums, but will be hosted by Angie Martinez. And through these first eight episodes in this inaugural season, they will be covering life after death. And they'll be talking about how it was an album that defined a generation. They'll have interview with rappers like Rick Ross, Pusha T, Fat Joe, Havoc, Too Short, as well as other DJs, producers, some fashion designers, interns who were close to big at the time of his death and that album release. And so the interviews are going to be on that show will be done over a five night span and a total of 25 interviewees will speak throughout the season. And I think this is a great idea for a series. And I think that starting it off with a Biggie album like Life After Death and making it about iconic records and albums that defined a generation is something that I think is truly, truly great. And I think that doing something like this and coming up in the era which I came up with, I can honestly say that that Life After Death album is an album that helped to partially shape my generation and define my generation. So that got me to thinking, if I were to sit back and think about albums that defined my generation, what would it be? In particular, I got to thinking about the years that we're covering this year with the Vault Classic Music Reviews podcast, 93, 1998, and 2003. And thinking about, were there albums during those years that defined the generation? And I think when we talk about albums that define a generation, we want to quantify them in a couple of different terms. One... Not only was it memorable in quality, but did the quality of the album and also the content of the album spark either a movement, a shift in the culture as far as when it comes to dynamics or slang or staying power that was present within the industry, did things shift the result of this album with its content, the lyrics, some of the trends that were happening that may have been started as a result of this? Are there albums in these years that meet that criteria? Well, there definitely are in those three years and definitely three exemplary years in hip hop as we're talking about. So I sat back and thought about what were the albums in 93, 98 and 03 
that would be considered albums that would define a generation. And that would be largely my generation. And you hear a lot of talk about the differences between Gen X and millennials. And then those of us who are Xennials or elder millennials, he's like to call or the bridge generation. Those of us who sort of grew up and were in the midst of what gen, the latter part of Gen X and in the beginning part of the millennial generation that sort of dealt with the analog world and also the digital world, a life without the internet and also a life where the internet dominated everything. We had the best of both worlds. So when I think about albums that define that generation and the albums in those particular years, it was pretty clear to me to sit back and think about those albums, what defined that generation. So I'm going to go through with them. and I'm going to start with the year of 1993. Now, lots of great albums that came out during that year. You know, during the first episodes of the year, we talked about the year that was in 1993. We laid out some of the albums. So many of them we're going to cover here on the vault. But we didn't want to talk about the albums that define a generation. To me, these are the four that stand out to me the most as far as generation defining albums. For that year. The first for me that I look at it, of course, has to be a personal favorite of mine's, A Tribe Called Quest, Midnight Marauders. Many of you will sit there and say, well, yes, Midnight Marauders is a great album, but so many of you will note that their previous album, The Low End Theory, which came out in 1991, may be their best album, and also will probably be an album that would be more worthy of praise than this one. But I do have to say we need to give props to this album for what it meant in regards to what this generation. And I'll say it for this. Midnight Marauders, while maybe not having the accolades, I would say, come up front like the Low End Theory did. Look at some of the tracks on here that became some of Trap Quest's most iconic songs that even resonate 30 years afterwards. And you know them. Award Tour. I mean, <laughs> that's one of them. I mean, that's a big enough one right there. That is a massive Trap Call Quest hit, and it's something that has become a cultural iconic song. And an electric relaxation. I mean, come on, just stop and think about that. <laughs> that literally was a song that made it to the theme song of one of the more popular sitcoms, black sitcoms of the 90s with the Waynes Brothers. Hearing that iconic beat of that Ronnie Foster's Mystic Brew with that sample in those drums, just iconic. And then the other songs on here as well with 8 Million Stories and Sucker Nigga and Stir It Up. The Chase Part 2, Oh My God, featuring Busta Rhymes, Keep It Rolling, and then Lyrics To Go with God Lives Through. A very classic album and something that I would say as cohesive as an album that I have heard any group put together within the last 30 to 35 years. And those two tracks right there of War Tour and Electric Relaxation are two songs. The few times that I've been to see Trap Call Quest perform are the two songs that they close out they're set with a war tour usually being the one that they close their set with and midnight marauders if you talk to a lot of people they will probably juggle back and forth between the low end theory and midnight marauders as to what is better but a lot of folks will cite this as their favorite album and to me the legacy of those two songs in particular helped make this an album that defined this generation for the next one for 1993 i'm actually going to go in a little bit of a different direction i'm going to go back out to the west coast and i'm going to go to a very underrated album at that time which has now gained so much props in the 30 years since it dropped and i'm so glad that it has because it's such a dope album and definitely a classic to me and that souls of mischief 93 till infinity and I mean, you want to talk about an album that in the 30 years, I think has had its stock rise as much as any album that's come out since 1990. Souls of Mischief, 93 Tone Finley definitely has that. And then you have to look at the single and the title track itself is a classic track in hip hop history. But the album, 93 Tone Infinity, is really a quality, consistent level album that gives you nothing but consistent hits. And the quality never drops in that album whatsoever. But if you look at what they helped to do, Souls of Mischief did. Now, when it comes to alternative hip hop, you saw mostly what Farside did in the previous year with Bizarre Ride to the Far Side, helping to sort of bring that alternative to what was coming as a part of the West Coast G-Funk era that was starting to dominate the sound. Also, what is happening in the Bay Area, which is emerging, was there with Too Short and Rich Rich and Spice One and E-40. This was a different sound coming out of the Bay Area as well. So it was a mischief for part of that hieroglyphics collective giving you a sound and also helping to redefine what west coast lyricism was during that time a lot of people will look back at 93 till infinity and show just how influential it was 
to so many different acts afterwards. You can look at some of the groups that emerged afterwards that were part of the West Coast scene back then. Jurassic 5, Dilated Peoples, groups of that matter, all were probably influenced by what Souls of Mischief and the rest of the Hieroglyphics clue were able to do back during that time. So to me, an album that defines a generation because of the, what it brought to a region that at that time was being defined by a certain type of sound, I think that qualifies as well. Now, if you talk about hip hop in 1993, you cannot have the discussion without talking about this group. And this group helped to create a phenomenon that created almost a subculture within the culture itself. And that is Wu-Tang's debut album, Enter the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers which dropped in 1993. Ironically enough, the same day that the Trap Called Quest Midnight Marauders did as well. And you want to talk about what Wu-Tang developed into over their time. When this album came out, when it dropped, and over the years now, the 30 years since that album has dropped, and we have known Wu-Tang as a group, a super group, and a collective, and their individual parts of their members, it's been absolutely huge. The W, the Wu-Tang symbol has been something that is synonymous with that group, and it's something that is immediately recognizable as soon as you see it. The phenomenon that these guys created, the fact that they crossed over into so many different subsets of fans. You're talking about kids from the ghetto, New York, loved them. But then also, you can go out to the Midwest and kids that lived in Iowa loved Wu-Tang Clan. Out to the West Coast, they loved Wu-Tang Clan. The South, and then internationally, forget about it. In Asia, and then in Europe as well, South America, Wu-Tang became a global phenomenon during that time in hip-hop. And people love their style. They love the fact that they integrated the culture of those kung fu flicks and the quotes from them as well. Those beats, which were hard, gritty beats made by RZA. The lyricism by each one of those rappers. With Dex, the Method Mans, the Raekwons, the Ghostface Killers, the RZA's, the Jizzas, Old Dirty Bastards. Everybody that we're talking about that helped to make Wu-Tang Wu-Tang. This album really was an album that I would say became one of the few during the 90s that became a huge crossover hit without it being necessarily corny. You had a lot of crossover hip-hop stuff that crossed over to other audiences, and there will be some hip-hop heads that would say that it would be corny. This was definitely not corny. It was something that people from the streets, people from the suburbs, and internationally, everybody appreciated for that unique proposition that Wu-Tang had. And then finishing up the conversation in 1993, probably the biggest phenomenon and album that defined a generation during that year is none other than Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style. Yes. <laughs> you know it. I mean, I don't have to really explain a whole lot of how big this album was. This album helped introduce, really, I would say, a whole subset of slang uh sort of like mannerism i would have to say a disposition really a whole attitude towards things and how the way to snoop was really what snoop dog did previously which he also did on the chronic and through those videos that we saw with the chronic and eventually with doggy style snoop helped to bring us into a part of being and living on the West Coast, which made it really freaking cool for us to imagine being from there, being there to visit and living there. And what helped to make Death Row so big wasn't just Dr. Dre and his production chops and being able to develop talent. It really was built on the back of Snoop Dogg and what Doggy Style was and how big it was when it came out. Up until a certain point in time, this century, Doggy Style was the biggest debut selling album that hip hop had ever. Ever. Even 50 Cent's Get Rich and Die Trying, which came out in 2003, was big, but wasn't as big as Snoop's Doggy Style. I mean, you want to talk about something that was so big, the fact that Snoop was so highly anticipated that you get to the album and you hear the gin and juices and ain't no funds and hearing stuff, of course, like 187 and a dick in your mouth and I'm gonna grow up to be a motherfucking gangster and Deeg's nuts. Like, all that shit came into, like, the urban... And suburban lexicon of kids everywhere. And during that time when I was in elementary school going to middle school, man, this was really influential on the culture. Snoop definitely had something. And it's something that you don't see that often in the genre of music and also in hip hop and pop culture history. So moving on to 1998 and the album's there to help to define the generation. I'm actually going to start mine off with one that, you know, some people will say it's a hip hop album. I'd like to say that it's more of a mixture of genres because of the genres that it touches. And that the first one I would have to say would have to be Lauryn Hill's Miss Education of Lauryn Hill, her debut album. I mean, the hits on here that made 
such an impact on a wide variety of audiences. This was a huge album, so highly anticipated as well, because everyone loved Lauren's work with the Fugees and anticipated what she would sound like on an album by herself and what she would do. Not just showcasing her skills as an MC, but then as a vocalist as well. And all those songs that we remember from this album became so big. And it made such an impact that Lauren went to the Grammys the next year and cleaned up. I mean, Baby Girl cleaned up at the Grammys, winning, I believe it was, Record of the Year, also winning an award for Artist of the Year. There were so many different Grammys she walked away with, and that just goes to show you the impact of the crossover appeal that it had. You know, not just the lost ones, but the doo-wop, those things. X Factor, which has been noted as one of the best songs from that era. Zion, I mean, although can't keep my eyes off of you. So there are so many songs there, man. That really became an album that, you know, it lived on for quite some time. It's an album that even 25 years after it dropped, people are willing to still go see Lauryn Hill perform and have her show up notoriously late for to just perform songs from this album. The concert's late for how long? <laughs> That just shows, again, it's an album that helped to define the generation. The next one from 1998 we'll go to will be a big one, Outkast Equemini. And everyone has their opinion as to what their favorite album will be from Outkast. But to me, Equemini is one of those albums that is definitely undeniable to its impact in regards to what it did to the culture. Now, you talk about a group like Outkast that was already celebrated with their debut Southern playlist of Cadillac Music and then their sophomore album, AT Aliens. To come out with something like with the Quemini that was so complex and was able to showcase the talents of both of these MCs and then production wise to be able to show a depth of something that we had not seen on either one of their albums for them to reinvent themselves for a third time and then to make it something that it was not only so soulful, but so hip hop, but also so funky as well and spiritual in a sense, I would have to say. But those songs on Equemini from the Rosa Parks to the Spodio de Dopalicious to the Skewed on the Barbecue to Liberation. It was something that when you listen to it, sort of like the way that you hear every Outkast album, you sort of felt like you were been through an experience. But Equemini, one of those albums helped to define a generation because it's an album that we still talk about even now, 25 years later. So many of us, not just the best Outkast album, so many of us, our favorite one as well. And the third album from 1998, I'm going to go in a little bit of a change up direction. Some of y'all may be a little surprised that I would say this one, but I'm going to say Jay-Z's Volume 2 Hard Knock Life. Now, so many of you will sit back and say like, oh, you know, I don't know if I have Volume 2 with even my top half of Jay-Z's catalog. Well, let me explain to you why I think. Going into 1998, Jay-Z was starting to become a little bit of a bigger star, especially after Volume 1 dropped, and that proved to be a moderate success. But by the time that 98 rolled around and Jay-Z dropped Volume 2, Hard Knock Life, first off with the lead single, which is the title track of Hard Knock Life, with that Annie sample, it really helped to propel Jay-Z to another level. That song hit, and when it hit, it definitely hit. It was something that... So many of us latched onto, but then you get into other songs of volume two. Can I get a the money cash hoes? The it's all rights. Those songs on that album were songs that helped to make Jay Z the Jay Z that we know today, the commercial success that we know today. Those songs helped to make him oh from he's a hip hop star, somebody we know as a good MC and great MC to the point where it's like now this guy's a bona fide on the road to being a superstar. We saw that as he continued that momentum into volume three with the do it agains and the big pimpins, because those were big singles to help to propel him to be the biggest rap star in the game heading into the year 2000. But volume two was where it definitely all started. It's still to this day is Jay-Z's best selling album. That's crazy to think 25 years from now, the albums that have come out afterwards, the blueprints, the black albums. The Magna Carta Holy Grails, the Blueprint 3 series, even 444, which just came out. This is still Jay-Z's best-selling album at more than 5 million copies sold. And definitely, the songs, the singles on there, 
that made this album pop is what to help make Jay-Z the Jay-Z that we came to know, which became the biggest rapper in the game in the 21st century. Then the last albums from 1998 that I like to say were albums to help to define a generation are actually two albums by the same artist. And it's by none other of DMX. It's Dark and Hell is Hot and Flesh of My Flesh and Blood of My Blood. Now, when DMX hit in 1998 and these albums came out, well, the first one, it's Dark and Hell is Hot dropped in May of 1998. We have a review coming up for that as well, so make sure y'all stay tuned. But when that album dropped with the Get At Me Dogs and Stop Being Greedies and how it's going down, but getting into the depth of the album with the album tracks, it just, it was just so gritty and raw. And you could feel not only the pain and the hunger and sort of like the anguish that this guy was going through and it was palpable. Think something that we could all feel. It was something that helped us latch on the DMX as an artist and also as a person because it seemed also personable and it seemed to be something that wasn't like this rap star where everything was glitz, glamour, or just all violence. There was definitely a level of personal anguish that was there and something that eventually we came to know that wasn't just an act. It was him. It was definitely all him. So we dropped that album and it's a platinum album. Then later on in that year, he drops his follow-up album, which is somewhat of a risk to drop a follow-up that closely behind. But DMX was so hot and he dropped the album that was completely different than that debut that that album then also went platinum. And you want to talk about rappers that have dropped two platinum albums within the same year? The list is short. It's DMX and it's Tupac. That's it. <laughs> There's no other list on there. But this helped to springboard DMX into being sort of that artist that spoke to the anguish and to the struggles and the demons that we had. And also speaking to the fact that we all have hunger and desires to be able to make it and make something of ourselves. But knowing that it's also a struggle inside as well. He spoke to all of that. But those songs and those albums, it helped to help to define that generation in regards to knowing that there is music out there in the genre that can help us to tackle a lot of those things that we're also personally dealing with. So that helped to define the generation. And then in 2003, I don't have a long list, but these two albums here definitely did their part in defining a generation because of how big they were and what they meant at the time. The first one I'll go to is an album we covered earlier this year, and that was 50 Cent, Get Rich or Die Trying. I mean, we know how big that album was. As we spoke, you know, it was the second biggest debut during that time when it came out. 50 was one of the most sought after free agents in the game. He definitely made his mark, signed the Shady at Aftermath, having an album that has now almost been certified, I believe now certified Diamond, and the singles from that album, the fact that it hit so hard, the fact that, of course, a lot of people could relate to him. It was entertaining music, and it was big. I mean, 50 was the biggest rapper during this year in 2003. Then he followed that up with G-Unit, and then everyone from G-Unit dropping their albums afterwards. It was something at that point where 50 had that period between 2003 to 2005 where he was almost untouchable. And it all started right here. And an album to be his debut album to go diamond right out the gate. There aren't too many rappers that can actually say that they did that their first time out. And then the last album in 2003 that I'll say helped to define a generation was none other than Jay-Z's The Black Album. Now, at the time, The Black Album was supposed to be Jay-Z's final album before he retired from rap, in air quotes, before he retired from rap and went on to become the president of Def Jam, and that would be his new role as an executive. He wouldn't rap anymore anymore. And since this was going to be his farewell album, this was going to be a part of his goodbye. And the hype surrounding it, not just this being his goodbye album, the fact that Jay-Z was concluding this career that only after seven years was still so legendary was crazy. And it wasn't just the album. It was also the accompanying tour that was sort of like Jay-Z's farewell during that time. So everyone thought that we were saying goodbye to Jay-Z, the artist, and we would never see him again. A lot of us kind of sat there and side-eyed that. I'm like, yeah, man, this dude's going to make another album. Watch. He's not going to be able to stay away forever. And that will prove us right. But at that time, a lot of folks kind of said like, all right, well, Jay said he's retiring. He wants to be a businessman. Uh, knowing him, it probably makes sense. But that album and then the accompanying tour, it, it was just crazy. And then really the hype around it was absolutely huge. But then the album, you get into the album and the songs from that album that really are still huge 20 years later. The public service announcements, the change clothes, the dirt off your shoulders, the allures, those songs that stick with us, moment of clarity that stick with us for so long. Even the album tracks like Lucifer, 
I mean, it's uh, what more can I say? Encore. All of these tracks are tracks that are still huge now. We talk about the best Jay-Z songs of all time. You could pick probably a handful from there that could be in contention, if not more. And I remember, as they say, I was outside during this time when this album came out. And it was absolutely huge. And 50 was big in 2003, no doubt. He was the biggest during that year. But Jay-Z dropping this album late in 2003, this being his farewell album, it definitely was something that helped to spur on the next era of Rockefeller, which was then headlined and brought up and led by none other than Kanye West. So Jay-Z started a lot of trends. He definitely was part of the ones that helped to do that throwback jersey phenomenon in the early 2000s. The button-up thing became a big thing because he mentioned it here on this album, on the Black album, because he was growing up and said he was changing things up. He had to keep it growing and sexy. So you have to have the Black album in there. His albums helped to define a generation. And you know what? You could honestly have a similar eight part series or longer of any one of these albums that I mentioned, because they would be albums that would be generation defining. I would say, at least in my opinion. So there we have it. Albums that define a generation, our opinions on what they were in 93, 98 and 03. What do you all think about it? Hit us up. Let's continue the conversation. Are there any albums during this year that define a generation that we missed? Is there any additional comments you have on the ones that we named? Or do you think one of the ones we named doesn't deserve to be on the list? as similar as we talk about the albums that define a generation. Hit us up, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, IG. Let us know what you think. We love to continue the conversation. And that is going to wrap up yet another edition of The Vault. Please make sure you are visiting us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com. There you can learn more about the show, check out our past episodes, join our mailing list, leave a review, or if so inclined, you can leave us a voice note. Click the blue microphone in the bottom right hand corner to leave us a voice note to let us know what you think about the show or to just show us some love. To support the show, click the coffee cup shaded in yellow in the bottom left hand corner to access our Buy Me A Coffee page. On Buy Me A Coffee, you can give a small monetary donation to support the show to ensure that we can keep the vault open for many years to come. You can also visit us on social media at Vault Classic Pod on IG, Twitter and on TikTok. Also hit us on YouTube and our Facebook page. Like and follow us on social media. Subscribe to the pod and the YouTube channel. We do it here all for you. We appreciate the support. And if you have a friend, tell a friend and make sure that that friend tells a friend. Always remember to keep your headphones on and your music loud, but not too loud. And as we close, we like to remind everyone to dream big because dreams are the basis for creation. Always create, motivate and elevate. Because you were never destined or created to stay stationary or ordinary in this life. And on that note, we say peace. Thank you for listening and coming into The Vault. Please subscribe and visit us at vaultclassicpod.com. That's vaultclassicpod.com.